It's a pleasure to have as a last speaker for this uh, conference <coughs> Leo Oesten, professor of the University of Bristol, that uh, certainly you know very well for his uh, works. And uh, the title of his talk is The Absolutely Infinite, and here was the absolute infinity. So I think that there is some change in uh, you changing <laughs> your point of view in the meantime <laughs> about, uh, about that. So uh, uh, Leon uh, uh, decided to speak more or less 15 minutes and more to leave uh, 20 minutes for uh, questions and uh, discussion. So first of all, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give a talk here. Um, I've enjoyed the conference very much and I learned a lot from many of the talks. So, okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Now, um, I'm going to speak about the absolutely infinite and it's related to several talks that have already been presented here. Robert, Black, Robert Black's talk um, was relevant but also uh, the two previous talks were uh, related to my talk. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to speak about the relation between proper classes on the one hand and reflection principles in um, class theory on the other hand. <coughs> Sorry, could you keep the mic a little, a little bit higher? Yeah. Because I don't want to boom into okay, people's uh, work. <laughs> Am I audible? More or less? Yes? Okay, good. Um, the structure of my talk is going to be fairly simple. I'm going to start with a uh, Cantor's view on uh, the nature of the absolutely infinite. Then I'm going to talk about reflection principles. That will be the main part of the talk, probably. Then I'm going to um, spend some time on interpretation of the framework that I have been using for discussing these, for presenting these um, reflection principles. Then, towards the end, I'm just going to evaluate what the upshot of the discussion is. I'm going to make some <coughs> inflammatory rhetorical remarks to get the discussion going, and that will be it. <coughs> okay, so I'm going to presuppose mathematical Platonism about sets. I know that there are, that much can be, has been, will be said about it, but um, I'm just going to presuppose it for the purposes of this talk. I'm not going to bother with talking about Ur Elementa, even though in earlier, in earlier uh, frameworks of set theory um, they did play some role for my presentation, it won't play any role whatsoever, so I'm going to ignore them. And I'm also going to assume not only that um, sets exist as abstract entities in some sense, but I'm also going to assume that um, the sets are governed by the ZFC axioms. Again, a lot can be said about that. I'm just going to shoot the purposes of the story, otherwise it's not going to happen. Now, we've heard um, sophisticated views um, in this conference about the nature of the mathematical universe. So we've heard a variant of or a, va or, uh, or a variation on uh, Zermelo's point of view presented in uh, Robert Black's beautiful talk. We've also heard um, Presentations of um, variants of the multi of the multiverse uh, view, which is a very recent view, again a very uh, sophisticated view. I'm going to return to um, what is now, by most authors, seen as a very naive and outdated uh, view of the set theoretic universe, and that's Cantor's view. So. Briefly, Cantor says that the mathematical universe is a completed absolute infinity. That's, in a nutshell, what Cantor is um, telling us. Now, when you read Cantor's works, you will often be unsure whether if he's talking about the absolutely infinite, whether he's talking about a mathematical absolutely infinite or a theological absolutely infinite. Here's, for instance, an unclear passage. He says, most of the people confuse the transfinite with the distinction as one, with the so-called absolute, i.e. the absolute maximum, which of course cannot be determined, and therefore is not a subject of mathematics. 
it's not clear whether he has the mathematical absolute in mind here or um, goal, the conception of goals. <clears throat> but there are also clear passages, and that's the passages I'm going to be concerned with. Here's a clear passage. He says, uh, the transfinite with its wealth of arrangement and forms points with necessity to an absolute, to the true infinite, whose magnitude is not subject to any increase or reduction, and for this reason it must be quantitative, you can see, as an absolute maximum. So that's what I'm concerned with, not with the theological part of Kantra. But when you, when you then look at, Kant, at all these passages in which um, Kantor writes about uh, the quantitatively absolutely infinite, Kantor is not systematic as a philosopher, you must um, remember, then you will see that he conceive, conceives of the absolutely infinite as a determinant or as inaugmentable, we saw that just now, so there is some sort of absoluteness about uh, the absolutely infinite, that's why it's called the absolutely infinite, is completed, that follows from his so-called domain principle that I'm not going to talk about here, and it is of a mental nature. So mathematical entities, sets, are ideas in the mind of God, so the mathematical universe as a whole can be seen as a part of the mind of God in Cantor's Okay, now Cantor thought, Cantor did not see much mileage in developing a mathematical theory of the, of the absolutely infinite, as these two passages already showed. But later, later um, mathematicians and logicians thought that at least some principles could be written down governing the absolute deal. And this, now we're moving forward to more or less the 1920s. And already since the 1890s, it was clear that if there is one absolutely infinite, the mathematical universe, then there are many, for instance, the ordinals, who then also have to constitute an absolutely infinite, the cardinals, the transitive sets, and so on and so forth. And people like um, von Neumann, Gödel, Bernays, they thought that you can, you can write down a theory governing, a theory about these absolutely infinite uh, absolute infinite, uh, absolute infinities. Well, and this is called class theory. So we have two types of variables. You can see this as a second order theory, or a two sorted theory, whatever, whatever, however you want to talk about it, with um, lowercase variables ranging over the sets and uppercase variables ranging over the proper classes, proper and, in, and, and improper classes, but including the proper classes, crucial. And the action, the, the scheme of re replacement is now replaced by one class X to do that. And we have a predicative scheme of class comprehension, MBG, uh, the MBG comprehension scheme that I trust you're also all familiar with. So um, it is of course crucial that um, the, um, the schematic, for, uh, the, that the sentences that are, can be plugged in, the formulas that can be plugged in the place of the schematic variable are allowed to contain parameters. But that's all the reverse of what MBG is. But there is a philosophical problem here, namely, well, if you say that there is this um, collection of classes, they behave a bit like sets, because if you have a class here, or say a proper class, a proper class there, then you can take its union and get a third class, just like you can take the union of two sets and get a third set. So, isn't there then... Um, um, a collection of all the classes, and can't we take the power class of all these classes, the classes of all uh, <coughs> classes of classes, and then on pain of contradiction, that cannot itself be a class. So, aren't we pushed to um, accept something like superclasses? So now we have three ontological categories that are suspect already, and then we can do the same trick and. Um, uh, go to hyperclasses, a new ontological category, and we seem to be replicating the, the, the iterative hierarchy at enormous ontological cost, because now at every level we're introducing uh, an irreducibly new kind of uh, uh, entities. And what does it get us? What does it give us? So few people want to travel down this line, but how can it be, be blocked in a motivated way? It's not so clear. So this is a worry that we're going to keep in mind. Okay. Now, von Neumann and others gave these, this uh, class theory that at least lays down some principles governing classes, but perhaps something still remains of this thought that has its origins in 
um, in negative theology and even further back in Neoplatonism and even further back in some sort of marginal Jewish theological tradition, but that we're not, not going to talk about. But but it but it it, it certainly reached Cantor and it finds its uh, and, and you can see it in this famous um, quote here, this famous passage that's often quoted uh, by people about Cantor. The absolute can only be acknowledged but never be known, not even approximately known. Well at least we can know something about absolute infinities if NBG tells us something about them. But maybe there's some truth that remains of this. Maybe there's still some insight in a quote like this. Well, what's the idea? And the idea is, of course, the idea of reflection principles. The idea is that V, the mathematical universe as a whole, cannot be mathematically characterized as a unity. That's the idea. Well, that's a negative statement. And a negative statement doesn't really give you um, a lot of positive content all by itself. But we are, by, by formulating a theory of classes, NVG for instance, we've already given some positive um, content to um, uh, proper class talk too. So we can get positive content out of this in two ways. For instance, we can say if we just concentrate on V, that's the one here, now we can say for any property of the universe, of all sets, there exists a set with the same property. Or if you want to um, uh, take into account the fact that there are many absolute infinities, if we truly describe mathematical absolute infinities, then there are set proxies for the absolute infinities such that our description can also truly be taken to range over the elements of the proxies. That's, that's probably already a bit of a better positive statement. And Gödel thought that, this, that there was a lot in this um, positive view of reflection principles, in, in this sort of pre-mathematical, informal principle. He said, he, he thought that all sound large cardinal principles follow from reflection principles. So here's a quote, I won't uh, read it out uh, for you, but it's a, it's a well-known quote of Gödel. But modern, mo most um, modern day set theorists are skeptical. They thought most modern day set theorists think that Gödel is simply wrong about this. And we'll see why in a minute. Okay, so let's look at uh, reflection principles a little bit then. Well, we start below um, with um, sentences of first order set theory. So we're going to forget about the second order, uh, second order assertions that we can make of the uh, mathematical universe. For a moment. Just going to look at first order set theory. And then there is a, um, a, a theorem of CFC that says that if you have um, a formula of all three variables, say phi of x, first order, if it holds in the universe, then there is some uh, initial segment or a uh, rank alpha such that if you restrict all the quantifiers to the alpha and the three variables in the, in the, uh, in the formula are cut off. Um, at uh, V alpha, well, then that statement holds in that segment of the universe. A property hold of that cutoff part of the set in that part of the universe. That can be proved. So you'd say, well, that means it doesn't really have any new mathematical content. But the mathematical content is a little bit, is in some sense hidden. Because if you take Montague Levi as a principle, and, and add it to um, set theory without the axiom of infinity, which is a very strong axiom in ZFC, and without the axiom of replacement, which is a very powerful thing in ZFC, as has been discussed, then you get it back. So you can prove infinity and you can prove replacement from ZFC minus infinity and replacement, but with um, this reflection principle. So there's some strength, just masked by the strength that's already in ZFC. Now we can go higher, we can, we can go further if we take Cantor's point of view that these absolute infinities are all um, exist to be quantified over and so on and so forth. Then we can go to second order reflection and we can do exactly the same as we did. For, uh, we apply the same recipe as in Montague Lev Levy, except now to second order state. So if you have um, a property phi involving possibly um, nested second order quantification with some class variables free, well then there is again a level of the uh, 
of the V hierarchy, level alpha, such that if you restrict the whole, all of these first and second order quantifiers to that part, and you cut off this class at, at that height, well, it, uh, the thing will also hold in this uh, set-like part of the universe. Well, this gives us um, small large cardinal consequences. It gives us um, principles that are not provable in ZFC, the so-called indescribable cardinals, more or less. I'm not going to enter into what these things are. Then you can say, okay, now, we're, now we know what we're doing. Now we're going to climb up the large cardinal hierarchy by, doing the, by applying the Montague Levy uh, recipe to these so-called superclasses. Let us not worry about whether they exist or not. We do just, we're going to do exactly the same thing, and then we're going to go to the hyperclass, and so on and so forth. We're climbing up. But you can't do that. So this became clear in the early 1970s, that already third-order reflection is inconsistent with, with uh, second-order, with NBG. And, um, and, it's, and you can try to then withdraw a little bit from um, third-order reflection, but that means that you won't get much more than second-order reflection. So people around 1970, in the 1970s, came to the conclusion that reflection, that this reflection idea is not a very powerful idea for, uh, um, in, in the large cardinal hierarchy context. Namely, and this is more or less what Peter Kroner says in a very influential article in 2009, a very good article, that all sound reflection principles are compatible with phi equals L. In particular, you're never going to get measurable cardinals out of this. Okay. Now, um, but let's look at some of these large, larger large cardinals, say medium size and, and somewhat larger large cardinals. Well, they're all, they're, so the, the axioms postulating them nowadays are formulated in terms of the, of S, S principles positing the existence of elementary embeddings of parts of the universe into parts of the universe. So that's more or less, um, an, uh, that's an idea that traces back to Reinhardt and it's a, more or less an empirical fact that almost all known large cardinal principles can be formulated as, um, as elementary embedding principles. So they're all somehow equivalent to, uh, to principles of this kind. So for instance, the principle governing measurable cardinals is equivalent to, to positing the existence of an elementary non-trivial embedding of L into L. That's just one example. But there are many more examples. Um, <clears throat> Then there is the question, well, if that's what these principles are, then what we need is some sort of motivation of these um, embedding principles, stronger and stronger embedding principles. Then that's, that would amount to uh, motivation of the large cardinal hierarchy. <clears throat> and this is more or less the picture, and now I'm arriving at something that's, that's fairly close to, um, <coughs> to what... Uh, let's see. Okay. What has been said already, there is this distinction between intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation to some extent, as has been argued in the previous lecture, I think somewhat convincingly, the distinction is not very clear cut at all, but it also doesn't mean that, it's, uh, that there's no distinction at all here, as the previous, author, uh, the, the previous speaker also uh, mentioned, <coughs> also stressed. Intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. And the picture is more or less the following. CFC is intrinsically motivated by, to some extent, the iterative conception, but not quite. For instance, the axiom of, uh, of infinity, how is it uh, uh, in, uh, motivated by the iterative conception? Uh, <coughs> replacement, that was the quote, the Boulos quote that you put up. Maybe it's not, in, uh, I mean, it's controversial. Some people say that replacement is iteratively motivated, but most people are doubtful, as you say, it's in Boulos. But then people wheel in this limitation of size um, um, idea. So maybe it's a, it's a combination of um, intrinsic ideas that motivate CFC. And that seems to me more or less the, the picture that people have arrived at. And then with respect to small large cardinals, perhaps these reflection principles do something for us. That these transcendence um, considerations that <coughs> that um, the famous contour quote illustrate. Well, perhaps they give us something like second order reflection, um, given that you, that you buy this picture of contour that, uh, of, uh, of the existence of these um, absolute infinities. 
Um, well, they, they, but they will get you to somewhere in the neighborhood of the indescribable cardinals, perhaps a little bit above that, but not far beyond above that. And if you want to go further than that, that if you want to motivate, for instance, the existence of measurable cardinals, you'll have to do something fundamentally different. And this, what you have to do, traces back to Gödel, namely, you have to look for different kinds of motivation, extrinsic motivation. And, and that's just inference to the best explanation. So it, it has all these nice consequence, consequences, whatever the niceness consists in, I'm not going to talk about that. And you say, how can something have such nice consequences if um, it wouldn't be true? How could a principle have all these nice consequences that all fit together very well if it wouldn't be a true principle? And again, um, opinions are strongly divided as to how much support and to extrinsic considerations give to these large cardinal hypotheses. But I think it is uh, um, generally acknowledged that it would be nice if we would have some sort of intrinsic pool um, or intrinsic support for these larger large cardinal principles. And that's what I'm, I'll, I'll try to provide uh, or argue. Oh, by the way, I should, I should stress that this whole paper is uh, based on, uh, on, on joint work with, uh, with Philip Welch, and I'll give him um, especially credit at some point where, where he definitely needs to get more credit. Or where am I going? I'm going to the world. Okay, so now Philip said the following. Philip, Philip Wells, my colleague in the math department in Bristol, had the following idea. He, he formulated a sort of template for stronger reflection principles. He said that the second order reflection principles that go back to Bernays and other people, they reflect sentence by sentence. So you have one sentence, true of the whole universe and its classes, that is reflected down in some sense. You have another sentence, another second order sentence, a class sentence. It's reflected in, into possibly a different part of the initial segment of the universe. The third sentence, reflected in possibly a different part of the set theoretic universe. But Philip thought, well, why can't we um, why can't we posit that a whole class and a whole infinite class of sentences is reflected all at once in one single um, initial part of the universe? So some sort of uniformization of this second order principle is what he's proposed. So what he says is, well, let's posit a, a principle along the following lines, that there is a kappa, a cardinal number, which is a critical point of an elementary embedding J, which takes um, an initial segment, the, uh, the, the initial segment of the universe up to rank k, kappa, and the next level up to the um, whole universe with all its classes. And evidently, in order to, um, to even take, to even consider this principle as a candidate, you have to believe, you have to, you have to accept the whole universe and its parts. Whatever, whatever that means. So if you don't take the Cantorian point of view, story over already. You don't know what we're talking about here, even when we form. And here, this is where I would like to oops, sorry, um, give this little picture that I drew while you were drinking coffee. <laughs> So this is the picture. This is this is the oops. This is this is the picture. So we have this little part of the universe, an initial segment up to rank kappa plus one, where this last rank is is the um, this last segment of the is the um, is the domain of the second order quantifiers. The whole universe uh, up to there is the domain of the first order quantifiers. So this thing provides um, a structure that interprets the language of class theory, right? Here we have the whole universe, and the domain of the first order quantifiers is just all the sets. And the, the domain of quantification of the second order quantifiers are all the parts of the universe, all the, proper, all the, all the classes, we would say, right? So we have two structures that interpret the language of second order CFC or the language of class theory or whatever you want to call it. And then what we say is that there exists an elementary embedding and 
uh, a level of the hierarchy such that this, this embedding sends the structure up to the universe. And that if you postulate that, and the embedding has to be more trivial, then um, it will follow that this, this function will just be the identity uh, below kappa, and kappa will be taken to the class of all ordinals, and every, um, every, every set in here, so every class according to this structure, will be taken to um, a class in, the, uh, in V. Right. But it is crucial that the whole uh, power set, uh, the, the whole next level above the kappa is the domain of uh, the secondary quantifiers. Otherwise, you won't get large cardinal strength that we're interested in. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, but of course, I have not really been very precise at the moment because I talk about elementarity, so that's this subscript E here, but I haven't specified what kind, kind of elementarity I'm talking about. So, precision, so the details have to be filled in. But it's the template that is the real idea, right? So that's, and that's what And then the rest is details, as some people would say, but not quite. I would say. I, well, I, this is part of the point of this talk, is that it's not that the rest are just details. So um, what, you can, uh, what you can show is that all class models any class model satisfying such a global reflection principle contains unboundedly many measurable cardinals in the order. So if this is really a reflection principle, then um, transcendence intrinsically motivates um, yeah, the principle of measurable cardinals. Moreover, these, um, uh, the, there will be unboundedly ben many wooden cardinals by, by, um, by analyzing the argument a little bit further. So that means that um, the global reflection principle proves the determinacy of the projective set, so it freezes analysis and the set theorists are happy. And I don't know what they're talking about. Okay. Now let's look at elementarity, degrees of elementarity. So what does, it, what does the elementarity mean? It means that this set structure makes um, a sentence phi true of a class, if and only if, um, the, um, the absolute uh, V with all of its classes as a second order structure makes phi true of whatever this, um, um, this thing in V kappa plus one is sent to. Right? But that holds for all phi's in some class, in some infinite cla in, in class, of infinite class of sentences. But which set of sentences are we talking about here? And Philip says, well, we should really be talking about only the sentences that have um, first-order quantifiers, no second-order quantification. And the reason is that he doesn't want to commit himself to quantifying over proper classes. I'm, I don't have shared these scruples that much, so one can look, but also, so this is kind of a lower bound. And this is equivalent to the global reflection principle for all the first order formulas. Of course, with parameters, otherwise you don't have With second order parameters. But you can also say, no, let's reflect the whole second order uh, language. That's kind of, then you'd say, well, GRP with elementarity cranked up to um, second order formulas. That's a stronger principle, right? And now we have precise principles because we've made precise what. Level, what notion of elementarity we're talking about. And there are principles in between, presumably, strengths in between. Okay, but I think one can even go further. Because what, what have we done so far? We, we said, well, um, we've cranked up the elementarity a bit, but one thing, is that one thing we left very uh, constant, namely the size of the language. It's a countable language. It's a finite area thing. But you could say, well, angels speak languages too. They speak infinitary languages. They're set-sized. But set-sized is still very small when, it com com when, it, when it's compared with uh, uh, V with all of its classes. So um, transcendence of V and its classes should tell us that, uh, no matter, that, that um, for any set-sized language, so set, set many um, disjunctions, first order quantifier, second order quantifiers. For set sized um, languages, um, 
this kind of elementarity should also hold. Right? <coughs> Maybe that's a lot strong. In fact, I don't know. So this could be inconsistent for all I know, but I would be very disappointed if it, if it would turn out to be inconsistent. Um, okay, one thing you have to be careful about in the meta language, I've, I've talked about elementarity, and that means talking about truth in a model. Now, truth in the set like model, V kappa, V kappa plus one, well, we can formulate this in the language itself, in the second order language itself. But truth in, in, uh, in V and its, and, its all, and its classes, I can't, right? By Tarski's theorem. So, if I formulate this principle in the meta language, I need some sort of Tarski and satisfaction predicate to formulate it, right? But that's, that's fine. We know how Tarski and satisfaction goes. I think it's totally unproblematic. Ex but you could say, well, let's crank up the, la the elementarity even more. If everything we can say of the, of the universe is reflected somewhere uniformly somewhere below, then that includes everything that's, that we can say using the truth graph. So we close this whole thing up, but now we get into trouble, right? Because that means that we are going to apply the Starsky um, um, truth, um, truth axiom scheme, compositional truth axiom scheme, to a language itself containing the, the Tarskian truth predicate, immediate inconsistency. So if you want to do that, then you better be careful with your truth theory. Then you have to move to a type 3 truth theory in the, in, the, in the spirit of KF, satisfaction version of So careful with the truth practice. But um, that's just a technical problem. I'm not so worried about it because if you are careful, it is, it will still be consistent. But um, there's a philosophical question that I'm much more worried about. Namely, if no theory in any language at all singles out V and its classes and the element truth relation, then what, what was I talking about so far? I talked about V and its classes a lot. But what could then possibly make it so that when I did this, I was talking about V and its classes rather than some big uh, initial segment of set like its uh, set size initial segment of the universe? Because my principles, principle itself would, stip, would, would postulate that there is this ambiguity. Right, so how, so then we are we really have a deep question about indeterminacy of reference, and this translates back into a theological question about um, well, if God is so ineffable and if we can say nothing true about it, how can we refer to him at all in the first place? But that's the theological context context that I should stay away from because yeah, it never gets you. It's never good for the discussion to talk about that too much. So. Okay, so I've postulated, well, I've postulated all these instances of this template of uh, Philip, which of them are consistent and which of them are inconsistent. That's the first thing. Well, from the existence of a one extendable cardinal, I'm not going to explain what it is, and it follows that um, the uh, global reflection principles for first order formulas is consistent. It gives them all. But for the, from the global reflection principles for second order formulas, for class formulas, it follows that there's a one extendable cardinal, so it goes beyond that. But from then third, then you say, okay, then how strong is it? Well, you, you only have to go a little bit be above that. From the existence of a subcompact cardinal, it follows that GRP up to um, uh, GRP for second order formulas is consistent. And, and, and here there's. Then, and now I can make it somewhat more precise why Philip is worried about this stronger version. Is that these one extendables, they mark a sort of a watershed in the theory of large cardinals. Namely, there is a, a discontinuity phenomenon that shows up for these elementary embeddings exactly at that point. So the, the, um, the, embeddings, the embedding associated with these one extendables is discontinuous. It has to be discontinuous at kappa plus. And that's exploited over and over and over and over again in the theory of these large cards. So something completely different happens there. And the inner model theorists don't, don't really know how to, how to treat this stuff. So it's, the game changes. And Philip says, I'm worried about that. I'm not worried about that because I'm a philosopher. And I believe <laughs> in the, uh, and, and, and um, well, I'm guided by the, by the, by the intrinsic considerations rather than by the consequences. So here there's, there's a point where you can say, well, am I interested in the, su the success, the extrinsic considerations, or the intrinsic considerations? I think Philip and I part ways here. And it's, in part it's just because I cannot walk 
for him because I don't know all these, don't know enough about these consequences in the very large companies. Okay, <coughs> let's go on. So, but what are we talking about in the first place? Right, so um, we had worries about classes to begin with, and I said I was going to come back to it. Well, here, at this point, Cantor gave this theological story and people ridicule it um, widely. And I try to give a secular story. Sets are all the mathematical objects there are. That's all there is in the mathematical universe. All the sets together form a completed whole, V. It's an actual infinity, but an absolute. Which is not itself a mathematical object, on pain of Russell paradox, but a meriological object. It's a whole. It's a whole. Consisting of parts. And all the parts of V are just as complete as the whole universe is. So the, the actuality of V supervenes on the actuality of all the things that are in it, and the actuality of the parts of V also supervenes on that. So everything's as actual as anything else, also the parts. Every set is an element of V, but the part to it correspo uh, relation corresponds not to the element to it co uh, relation, but to the subclass relation. Part to it is not the same as element to it because not all classes are transitive. And this gives a justification of MDG and perhaps even of Morse cap. There again, Philip doesn't want to quantify over these, um, over these um, um, parts of the universe. I don't mind. And if you take this, if you, if you take this stronger version of global reflection where you um, crank the elementarity up to second order, then you will get and uh, more scaly in the background theory because it's, um, it will be reflected downwards. But if you only, if you only uh, insist on, the, on this restricted elementarity, you don't get this reflection of the second order theory downwards, so you don't get uh, more scaly. You stay with the background theory you started. That's what Philip knows. Not me. So again, this is again Marx where we part ways. And, um, why is there no um, class of all classes? Well, because, because um, parts are... Um, <coughs> um, uh, how do I put this? Um, parts of parts are just parts. So if you take all the parts of the universe and fuse them together, you get the, you get the universe back. You don't get the... Um, um, you don't get the super parts. That's the idea. The, the, the reason is just that these are fundamentally different things. These are not sets. Okay, so um, this should be GRP rather than GRF. This is the title. It's a second order principle. So this J can be coded as a second order entity. At, at first sight, you'd say, oh, this is a third order thing because it's a class of classes, but it's accountable. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a small class of classes because it's, it's limited by the size of this this um, um, set-like structure on the left-hand side of J, and, and it's ordered pairs of those, so it should, can all be coded up into one second-order thing. So J is a class. Right? And I've tried to argue that classes are parts of the universe, they are mereological holes, not mysterious. And I don't have to go up to third order. That's what I, that's what I want to avoid, to go up to third order, because it can't make any ontological sense of that. First order variables range over sets, the second order variables range over parts of the set theoretic universe. That's what proper classes are. These are meriological objects, not mathematical objects. And we also need a Tarski and truth predicate, but I'm, I'm not worried about that. This is totally unproblematic. Now let's look at the sophisticated view. These are, well, this is our main view. Uh, so this was a naive view, not a sophisticated view. Um, Cernelo says, as we've heard, the mathematical universe is a potential infinity of actual infinities, the so-called normal domains, we've heard about that, and um, there are some questions that one can ask, namely, because it has as a consequence, we can never quantify over all sets, because uh, the domain of this course that we're currently in will tomorrow be, a, will now not be a set, but tomorrow when we reflect on it, it will be a set. Um, but if we cannot quantify over everything, then what have I just said? Right? I've just done it. And if I haven't done it, I haven't said anything. So if Sermelo hasn't done it, then he hasn't said it. It's a bit of a problem for the Sermelo. 
Um, secondly, so this potential infinity, that's colorful language, but um, so it su suggests growing in some sort of di dimension, but it's hard to make precise. It certainly won't be growing in the temporal dimension or in the spatial dimension. Okay. But um, it will get us something. It won't get us downward reflection, it, but it, 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 this Romero picture does give you, give you some kind of upward reflection. Namely, you can argue that, uh, so it gives you a motivation for the strongly inaccessible cardinals, right? It means that for every um, situation that we're in now, we have a bunch of ordinals. There is a, 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 a larger, a next stage, where, um, which is a strongly inaccessible cardinal, which is a set, but which makes all the, uh, which, is, which is bigger than anything that uh, we now recognize to be a set, but which makes the axioms of CFC still true. But that's a very strong, uh, that's a very weak large cardinal axiom. It's much weaker than the axiom of indescribable cardinal. So it doesn't get you anywhere up there. Um, it doesn't give you any in intrinsic motivation for uh, large cardinals, I would say. So let's see. So this is the moral Zermelo's reflection principles. Uh, so Zermelo's upward reflection process cannot motivate second order reflection or global reflection. Class theory can be understood along pictorial lines. And against the background of it, global reflection principles can be formulated, made sense of. And these are supposed to be intrinsically motivated by these transcendence considerations, not transcendence of God, but transcendence of the mathematical universe. And that means that indirectly we have intrinsic justification for large cardinal principles, certainly up to the uh, one in extendables. And then here's the provocative uh, thesis that I end with, is that Cantorian view of the set theoretic universe as a completed whole is more powerful, more fruitful, than a Zermelian view of the set theoretic universe as a potential infinity of, uh, infinity of uh, normal things. Um, I found uh, your talk extremely interesting and the results extremely interesting and welcome, in a sense. I have th um, three short remarks. First, a historical remark. Um, you know that, that uh, Tony Martin presented a sort of direct argument for the fact that uh, elementary embedding principles are, uh, correspond to reflection principles. And now I don't remember exactly where, but uh, there is an argument in which um, he, he tries to show in a direct way. But here you have a, a, a that, that's a, a heuristic argument. Here you have a theorem, so it, it, in this sense I think it is, it is a well, very welcome. Um, the second point is this, the fact that you don't take a impredicative uh, comprehension, the fact that you stop, um, I think that um, von Neumann and the other people had a, a good conceptual reason to, reasons to do that, so, so I share Welch's uh, <laughs> worries, because in a sense classes since you don't want simply to duplicate uh, the, the notion of set, of course. So, uh, should be something uh, which can be, um, come from, from, basically from extensions of formulas, basically. In that sense, you shouldn't have uh, impredicative impre principles. Uh, third point, very shortly, the fact that uh, in a rational, in the, in the tradition of rational theology, uh, which is a very respectable tradition in the history of philosophy. There are at least three ways to talk about God, although we can't um, grasp uh, the essence, okay? okay? And uh, I leave it to you to translate this. I think that there are quite strict connections with reflection principles. The first is by means of uh, the results of uh, purported proofs of its existence. For instance, I can find the first cause, so I can I can think I can say that God is a cause. Hmm? The second is by negative the idea of negative theology, of course. You can say what it is not. And the third is by analogy, in which analogy is not the, the use use the term not in the uh, in a univocal sense, but not not in the 
equivocal sense, but by analogy, in the sense that there is not a, a confused resemblance, but an identity of relationship. So, for instance, when you say that, um, say, God is um, a father, it's not a lit in the literal sense, but there is a, a, an, a, an identity of relationship in a sense. Okay, uh, these are three ways in which you can, according to rational theology, you can speak about. So, I think that, for instance, uh, reflection principles have a lot to do with analogy and with, um, and with the negative uh, theology, but, but this should be much further investigated. But since you, you put this. Well, thank you for your comments. So, first of all, I would really like to see the reference or any references to this. Uh, Informal and to, to, to this argument by Martin. Tony Martin, yes, if, it's, if you find the references, very interesting. Secondly, in predicative um, comprehension for classes, you say that classes are given by extensions of formulas. That's not the picture as I have it. So, I have, for me, it's the, the Cantorian viewpoint says that the mathematical universe exists and all its parts exist independently of us, and then whether they're definable or not is just just as secondary as whether every part of this table is definable in our language. If, if there are really infinitely many uh, parts of this table, then maybe not all the parts of this table are definable. But nonetheless, um, um, they all exist. So, I, so this connection, so I don't, I don't, I don't think that uh, that in this picture one should see classes as reducible to uh, extensions of formulas. And then thirdly, with respect to rational theology, I, I, um, I could not um, agree more that there are, so, that there are interesting relations, relationships there. And that rational theology is a respectable tradition. But what I would actually like to see is um, also the other way around. So, of course, now um, rational theology is a respectable tradition, but it's not respected at the moment. Yes. <laughs> um, <coughs> but what one could do, uh, but some of the arguments that have been formulated in this in this tradition have been very, very sophisticated and actually a little bit along these lines. But what? But now we have this theory of large cardinals and, and these sort of embedding principles as reflection principles, as you said. I mean, this is in the spirit of what I was what I, what I was saying. But very sophisticated arguments have been formulated by these. Um, large carbon theories that might have some translation back into the theological context too. I don't know if um, any cardinal or bishop would be interested in it today. Car <laughs> Cantor tried and didn't get many interest, so I think today we will get very much interest either. But, but yes, thanks. So, I, I have an objection to the thing at the end, but I'm going to put it on one side because I'll have to talk about 15 minutes to say it. So instead I'm just going to ask a question about the presentation of the view, which is, on your view, you end up with objects that aren't in the range of our first order quantifiers, namely the parts of the universe. Some people are going to be a bit uneasy about this, but it seems that everything that you've said here and all the respective motivations would equally go well, go through with a Boulosian plural paraphrase, okay. and you get, you get, you can just run exactly the same stuff, you get exactly the same relations with, I mean, just part heard can, can just yeah. corresponds to being among, yes. and you get your results, but you have a more sort of, a less um, controversial ontological standpoint. But, but I, won't, I don't want to do that, so in, 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 in the paper we, we do discuss this, but um, I don't want to do that for the, for the, for the reason that, um, that then the motivation of these reflection principles is gone because then on the right hand side, uh, so on the left hand side you have um, V kappa and V kappa plus one, but on the right hand side you don't have the classes anymore. You only have the sets and plural ways also of talking about them. So this idea of resemblance or reflection is then lost and then, then sort of the, the conceptual or the, the intrinsic the intrinsic pool of the principle is, in my view, greatly diminished. So that's one thing. And secondly, um, two, well, so not everything is in the range of the, of the quantifiers. I don't know if much hinges on that. I could say, well, I'm talking in a two sorted 
language or I have two predicates, one for the sets and one for the, for, for the, uh, for the classes. Quantification is absolutely general, but I'll make sure to, um, to restrict the quantification um, whenever I need, whenever I want to talk about sets, I will say for all x, if x is a set, then, and such and so um, Yeah, just, just on the, the stuff you said about the plurals there, I mean, is that true? That I mean, I'm sure you could give a, a story where you get, you know, I mean, this is one thing that people like Iskiano have argued, is that the idea of inherently non-definable class is, sorry, inherently non-definable, some things that are not captured by any particular first order form is perfectly fine. It seems like you could get, even if you just say we can't talk about them, you'd still get the motivation of this, this resemblance between the things, however they may be, and second order parts of some big capital. I think I, I don't see why the argument would go through, but maybe, maybe we should talk about that later. Other questions? We're back. Huh? <coughs> you mentioned that uh, you mentioned that you can um, add a sort of cryptic definite sort of truth predicate uh, to the language. Excuse me, Eric. Could you please hold? Sorry. You might um, you yeah. The, you said you can add a cryptic definite sort of truth predicate to the language to strengthen the uh, embedding. Um, but you didn't say much about uh, what sort of uh, consistency strength you get from that or what extra large cardinals you, you might get from that? Well, I, I, <clears throat> so first of all, I think it, it must be cons it, well, it, it, well, I think it, it must be consistent for more or less the same reasons as the, the, the one without the, um, the, the, the self-referential truth feature. Because if you do it in a KF way, because it's all positive, so you build on something that exists, at least if you believe in something like standard of cardinals or something close to that, then if you build positively on that, it will still be fine. But it won't be it won't give you much um, won't give you much more. How much more I we yeah, have to give. But it's something that, that's worth looking at. Luca? A small follow up. But um, when you were saying that you in, uh, you have a meteorological approach to the universe uh, and uh, isn't that sufficient uh, to avoid, uh, I don't know, it's a real question, uh, isn't, uh, isn't that sufficient to, to, um, to give an argument against impredicative comprehension in the sense that if you do impredicative comprehension, you seem to assume conceptually that you have a totality well defined uh, over which uh, second order quantifiers range, okay? That's the basis of uh, the idea of, of impredicativity. Uh, but you were saying that, uh, uh, yes, you do have a, a, a totality, the totality of parts of V, but this is not a totality in the sense of the new domain of over, or, of, uh, in, in uh, over structure, so to speak. So couldn't, couldn't you find a, a sort of an argument from, from this to say, well, it's better, there is a difference uh, uh, between uh, uh, first order quantification in comprehension principles and second order uh, quantification, so so that you you couldn't go to to you shouldn't go to KM but stay with the uh, MBG. Well, I think what you're articulating is more or less the worries that, that my colleague Philip has. And so, yes, there may be an argument to to run in, 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 that, in that direction. It, it, it yes. Perhaps. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering why can't you. Thank you very much. I'm just wondering why can't you put this into the uh, Tomelo picture by talking of those models in which global reflection holds. So, I mean, global reflection, if you're going to put it in as an axiom schema. Uh, then there will be models in which it holds, and you can sort of cut out all the other models in the Tomelio hierarchy if you like, and just leave the ones in in which global reflection holds. And so you get lots of them. But how how would you how would you what would be the motivation from a Zermelo point of view for thinking that there are any such mo models where it holds? That's what I. Think. Right. This is 
the motivation. But you could you could you could put them in, and therefore you would get something which it is, as it were, stronger than your version because it's got a, a transfinite hierarchy of the things that you've got. Well, for, if if you um, so those would those would be sets, right? Sets, yeah, yeah, set but, but structures in which in that make this principle true. But, but, yes, principle, but, but if the principle is satisfiable, it, there must be such things. No, no, that's that doesn't follow. So, for instance, you could you so this principle is formulated in the meta theory, yeah. and and it makes some demands about the set theoretic universe and its parts, but it does not entail that this principle itself holds in any of the set structures, in any of the initial models. What does hold? No, no, because obviously the principle can't be one of the things that get reflected, or you'd be straight into contradiction. Yes, exactly. You'd get an infinite yeah. ascender. So, so no, yes, so that's what the answer for this Thank you. A follow up to this, because this is essentially the objection that I restricted myself from. Crazy, which is so what's the reason for thinking that universe is ineffable at all on the absolutist picture? Something like you know, or the reasons Philip gives anyway are richness considerations. There's so much stuff that you and then you just you just plug that straight into the Zemanian picture and say you know, if that's a general principle about the subject matter of set theory then you should expect, expect reflections. And okay, you're not going to get as many measurable woodens as on the absolutist picture. You only get beta many for some very large beta, but you still get all the stuff like projective determinacy out and all the things that you want, all the extrinsic stuff. Um, I'm <coughs> Well, first of all, if if you uh, if if you if you think, I mean, it's like with, for instance, the limitation of size. If you think that that motivating idea does nothing for me, well, then the game that you're not going to accept certain axioms. For instance, perhaps replace. If ineffability does nothing for you, then you shouldn't be tempted to of of the uh, accept. You shouldn't be tempted to accept these. Principles, Maybe. but if you are accepting them, and if you are in uh, in um, in a Zermanian picture, then I don't even know how you can state this uh, this principle, how you can make sense of it, because it's ineffability of the mathematical universe. But you're always only in a set-like domain. Yeah, one V beta is ineffable from the perspective of another. It's the sort of thing we should accept, given that we're working in set theory, which is maximally rich. Which is the sort of thing the absolutist has to say to get an ineffability of their view. Mm. It's something like the universe is ineffable because there's so much stuff in there we can never pin it down. So that's that, 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 that's not a Zermanian thought, right? No, that's not. But then, <coughs> I mean, you can still appeal to general richness considerations if you're Zermanian. If you went to the back. I think of that. As a million, if the absolute is going to be able to bridge this to get enough for their universe, then... But, but can you? Because, because I, I, I don't know. So, the, so for me, the, the richness is more, more, it's more at home in the multiverse-like um, uh, considerations. It's more in, at home in the multiverse-like setting. Because in, in the Zermelo thing, it's, it's, it's always upwards from, you know, you just, you, you, you just, one is an initial segment of the other, so I don't okay, we, see I'll, the richness. Uh, I'll talk to you about this. Okay, sorry. Too. So, there are no other questions. I thank Minute. No, but I would so, I would like two seconds because I'm the I'm the last a speaker, so I should. I, I thank will you. give I will give you <laughs> time, but first you will be the last one to thank. There is a, something that is still in the conference. In the conference. <laughs> I would. Uh, that's it. Uh, Francesca and I would uh, really uh, like to thanks 
all the invited speakers who accepted our invitation, the contributor speakers who gave a talk, in absentia, all those who submitted to the conference. Uh, we would like also to thank our chair and the members of our scientific committee and the panel of our um, international reviewers um, for making what we uh, hope was a great conference. Uh, our warmest thanks goes to Marina, who while preparing her, her talk gave us the most precious help in uh, organizing this uh, conference and also to, uh, last but not least, to our absurdly committed crew of graduate and postgraduate students and that's Alessandro, Anna, Carlo, Gian Giuseppe, Joachim, Luca, Maria Paola and Riccardo. Uh, we really hope you enjoy the conference. And, uh, we hope to see you at the next conference of what we will be at, hopefully, at least an uncountable number of uh, film art conferences. <laughs>